You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident fanalist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore data. So today we've got a little bit of news and notes. We've got some questions, and then we've got some kind of broader questions that are floating out there that I wasn't asked directly. There was also the video of Zadarius Smith talking on PFT. Um, great interview. I really, really appreciated it. Uh, you, it's stuff that you don't like to hear necessarily, but um, it's also things that give you hope a little bit, you know, because I think sometimes we kind of go to the extremes. Um, believe me, I've gotten the messages, not naming names, but there are some people who just, who still can't let it go. This team is garbage. I hate this team. Well, they don't say that, but I mean, basically, you know, NFC championship game, but this team is the Miami Dolphins. I don't know, whatever. I'm not going to dedicate the time to try to figure out how that works logically. But you hear him kind of just come out and say what he said, and it's like, all right, you know, that's just what it is. It's not as dramatic, and this is a nightmare, and they're they're so far away, and they'll never... It's just a game, dude. They just got whooped on. You know, it happens. And there's definitely reasons and definitely things that can get approved, improved on, but, um, you know, there's there's zero reason to sit here and wallow in the fact that we're really far away. Even if the schedule wasn't that hard, and I promise you it wasn't the easiest schedule out there, bad teams don't go 13-3. and They don't. Mediocre teams with a kind of simple schedule don't go 13-3. and Mediocre teams don't even win that many times when the game is close. They lose them. That's kind of what makes them bad to mediocre. So there's a lot of good there. There's a lot of good. Build on that. You know, it'd be so dramatic. But I'll try to elaborate a little bit on that uh, later. Otherwise, I did have somebody reach out the other day and say, would you mind expanding upon where you got those numbers from for yesterday's episode? I mentioned that they weren't my numbers, but I didn't mention where I got it from. Those numbers come from over the cap. They do just like Track does, but it is there. You have to be a premium subscriber for that. So if you feel the need to pay for that, you can, but I kind of feel like I pay for it so you don't have to, is sort of my mentality. Also, we've got patrons that support the show, and that's kind of what the money's for, so that I can go get those things, so that I can provide you that kind of... I mean, if you want to do it and you want to really grind, I don't care, go for it. They, they, you know, they deserve the extra money. I just don't want you to pay for something that I already told you, and that you can just ask me if you have any questions about. And yes, that is one of the many things I have a premium subscription to, thanks to my patrons. Speaking of, if you would like to support the show, this is the final day of the month. This is your last chance to jump in on Patreon and get involved in our giveaway. And I'm going to give you one extra little thing. Starting next month, but technically starting today, because I want to give people an extra little incentive to jump in, for those that are kind of on the fence, patrons in February are going to be given a uh, a promo code for uh, Teespring, for where my merchandise is so if you're kind of on the fence or if you're planning on buying something it would actually be financially prudent for you to jump in on patreon for a dollar because you'll save more than a dollar so i don't know if anybody was planning on buying any merchandise but if you were got a little something for you but that will be for patrons i will post that promo code i'm going to try to remember to do it today but i forget 90 percent of the stuff that i tell you i'm going to do so don't hold me to that but you will get that that uh, promo code it's for february I hate saying that word so much because my brain knows there's an R there and I feel like I have to pronounce that. And then when I say February, my brain is like, that's not it though. There's an R. And then when I say February, it's like, what is wrong with you? Why would you say February? You know that's not the word. I don't don't know. I just, I try to avoid it. Just like Antonio Brown, try to just stay away from it. Otherwise, make sure you are in the Facebook group. Make sure you like the Facebook page. And if you wouldn't mind leaving a rating and review, on any and all platforms that you are listening to this. I would also ask that you are subscribed to this particular podcast. If you are listening to a podcast, and it's my podcast and like five or six others, that is not my podcast. My podcast only has my podcast episodes on it. The name of the podcast is the Packernet Podcast. The logo that you're looking at 
should say Pack Daddy. If that isn't the reality of what you're listening to, I'm not saying unsubscribe. That's a great resource. The the uh, the one that I the one that the logo says Packernet, so I know it's confusing. It's a great resource if you want to listen to a bunch of different podcasts in one. I'm just asking if you wouldn't mind subscribing at the very least to mine, and then you know if you wouldn't mind jumping over to mine and listening to it there. Again, this is just so that iTunes and things they they don't know that you're listening to mine if you're not listening to mine. Again, I still get the downloads, so as far as the advertisers are concerned, they're like, okay, he's still getting a bunch of listens. But iTunes is like, there's like 40 people listening. I actually don't know because I can't see the numbers, but clearly iTunes doesn't like me for some reason, and that's what I'm blaming it on. So if you wouldn't mind, just go, I mean, if you just type in Packernet, it's going to be the top one. And again, the logo is going to say Pack Daddy. The name of the show is Packernet Podcast. Just subscribe to it. Just do it. Thank you. All right, let's take a break. Got a little bit of a late start, so I have to try to talk fast and uh, not stall much. Here we go. This episode of the Packernet Podcast is brought to you by The Athletic, a subscription-based sports news site for real fans. If you're willing to pay for this kind of a service, it's going to end up being sort of your ultimate go-to for news. Because you're not going to be sifting through pop-up ads. You're not going to be clicking on something because it has a salacious title and then halfway through the article realize this has been a waste of your time. You get what you get, and what you get is quality. I don't know if you guys remember when The Athletic was a thing, and everybody just started announcing, like all the the big-name people, I'm going to be going to work for The Athletic. And my question was, what is The Athletic? And why do I care about this announcement? And why is everybody going over there? And honestly, my biggest question was, how much money is this costing The Athletic? These guys had some big investors, I'll tell you what. We're going to pay some big-name people and entice them to come over here, to pay them enough to entice them to come over with, like, no guarantee of any money. Like, just because I'm sure I'm betting this is going to work out. And guess what? They're still afloat. How? How are they paying all this money to all these massive people and pluck all the best writers away from whatever jobs they had, infuse that much cash into it, and have not completely collapsed by now? You know why? Because they have lots of people that feel like paying this little bit extra is worth the money, despite the fact that there's free content everywhere. They feel like paying that amount of money to keep it afloat. And so if you're ready to give this a shot, head over to theathletic.com slash overtime to get 40% off a yearly subscription. That's theathletic.com slash overtime. Make sure it is lowercase spelling. And if you're wondering where is the best place to read such glorious articles, it's simple. You bust out your phone when you're kicked up in your hotel in Arizona after a long day hiking and watching baseball and eating lots of food. I'll be honest, I don't know much about Arizonan food, but I know just based on the region, they're going to have some good Mexican food. And I looked it up a little bit. Top of this one list is called Cheese Crisps. Never heard of it. Only thing I can think is that retired people from Wisconsin went down there and like, you know what? We need to bring our culture to Arizona. And so they (laughs) created Cheese Crisps. And from looking at it, it looks like a giant tortilla with a bunch of cheese melted on it. And I 100% believe that is a Wisconsin thing. Because I'm sure I've, I've done that before. And it's amazing. And you should go eat one. And again, this is just another reason why you need to be in Arizona for the Cactus League spring training, man. Go enjoy it. Get to watch all of these different baseball teams. and all. You can go to a different stadium every day if you want to. There's 10 different stadiums. Let that be part of the trip. Either way, if you're willing to plan your trip, go to visitarizona.com slash springtraining and get excited. All right, where to start? I suppose we could start with the idea, or the idea, the news that Alvis Witted was fired. And of course, everybody has strong opinions on this, and it's another one of those things that kind of annoys me. I'm going to try to not get upset. But the consensus on Twitter is where, where all the, the brilliant people reside. And it, it listen, there might be truth to this. The thing that annoys me, though, is you don't know. Alvis Witted is the wide receiver coach, and he was let go. And so all the people who have very, very powerful minds have looked at the situation and said there's bad wide receivers, and the wide receiver coach got fired, and that's not fair. It's not fair that he got fired because Gutekunst didn't give him wide receivers. The problem is, you don't know that that's why he got fired. You don't know why he got fired. Obviously, underperforming wide receivers has something to do with it. But your assumption is that he did a very good job 
and did the best job that any wide receiver coach could do given the situation. Do you know that for a fact? Is it possible that two things are true at the same time? He didn't have a great group to work with, but also he did not do a very good job of getting people prepared. Has anybody noticed that despite the fact that Devontae Adams had like 15 catches and 300 yards a game over the last four games, Devontae was mostly invisible? That Devontae went from three years of like 10 to 15 touchdowns a year to like, I don't know, what did he have, like two? Not necessarily saying he regressed. I know he had a toe issue and I know he was hurt. Maybe it's a scheme chip. Again, maybe, 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 maybe. But everything always has to be maybe in, in, in favor of what you're assuming. Right? Everything that you believe is 100%. Everything that might contradict what I'm saying is only a maybe. No, nah, dude, you don't know. So instead of saying he got fired because the GM wouldn't bring him talent, which, again, is another assumption that you don't know, you don't know that he didn't try. In fact, we do know for a fact he did try before the trade deadline to bring someone in, and he said there was nobody available that was a good value. There were no good players that were good values. How do you know that wasn't the same situation earlier? Well, he should have taken a wide receiver instead of Rashawn Gary. Which one should he have taken at 12? So look, it's entirely possible that he got fired for an unfair reason. And and, and maybe there's more firings to come. But here's the thing. I went through a list of coaches that potentially could be let go. Of course he's on the list. Geronimo Allison fell completely off. Geronimo Allison, I've been saying since forever that Geronimo isn't very good. And everybody in Packers fandom said I was wrong, and you don't know what you're talking about. Geronimo was great. He's a number two. He was a a legit number two, and I was a fraud, and I didn't know what I was talking about. This year, everybody says he's terrible. And it's as though everybody always knew it, because you're a bunch of liars. I got dogged on the Geronimo Allison hate more than I did about Trash and Kevin King, because at least there were some people that didn't care for him. The fact of the matter is, though, the reason why everybody's on that bandwagon now is because at least before he was, like, maybe a number three-ish, he was legitimately one of the worst wide receivers in all of football this year. Marquez Valdez-Scantling, way worse than he's ever been, ever. Devontae, again, we can make excuses for why, but some of these statistics, despite some of them being great, right, a lot of receptions toward the end, largely because there was nowhere else to go, so he had to throw to Devontae. Because guys like Geronimo and MVS were doing so terribly. Where was Kumaro? It's another one. Everybody used to like Kumaro. Until this year when when most people are now saying he's no good. Why? Is it maybe because he was a lot worse than we're used to? Granted, he was never as good as his height. But the fact that people had the ability that he was good enough for people to at least delude themselves into believing he could be really good. In fact, during this year... The mantra was, he's good when he's on the field, he just isn't given opportunities. That was never true, but people felt like it was true. Now they know it's not true because they saw him on the field quite a bit, and and he just wasn't very good. So again, I'm asking you, is it possible that although Gutekunst, not because he actually believed we have a good group again, and I saw this individual on Twitter again, trashing Gutekunst for how much he praises the wide receivers. Dude, if you're trying to replace them and you can't quite find the right people and you're asked when you're at the podium about your wide receivers, do you think a GM is going to stand up there saying, they're trash, I tried, I couldn't find anyone, I'm sorry? No, he's going to say, we've got a really good group. We believe in what we have and da 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 So come on, man. And, and, and the fact of the matter is he's known that this isn't a good enough group. Last year was terrible for offense. All right, granted, a lot of these wide receivers panned out, but the idea at the time wasn't that this is a strong wide receiver class. After the fact, now it's like, dude, this is a pretty good wide receiver class. You got several people that were, you know, taken late in the first and even in the second that kind of panned out pretty well. There's a reason, though, they didn't go top 10, 12, 15. When in previous years, you got top 10, 12, 15 guys not even playing as well as some of the last few. But but the consensus wasn't that these guys are going to be as good as they are. Nobody knew Terry McLaurin and Debo Samuel were going to be this good. I know you did because you're a genius draft, Nick, and you always like Debo. I, I know, I get it. I re- One of the things I really, really want to do, and it's not to trash anybody, it's just to keep people from being obnoxious. What I really want to do is to have a database of big boards, kind of like I already have. And in fact, this would actually be kind of fun if I can figure out a way to do it. Actually, I, probably, I, well, I would have to give a lot of people access to the board, and then there's the potential for sabotage. But 
to to basically say, look, if, if you're doing this and if you really know what you're talking about and you're you're going to run your mouth about how I knew and I knew and I knew, I want you to build a big board and I want you to submit it to me. That way when you run your mouth again, we can go back and look at it. And yeah, I can see that you had Debo at 25th when most people had him at 32. I can see where you got like two or three things that were pretty accurate. And I can see where you got 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 things that were ridiculous. So stop it. But look, my, my thought on Alvis Witted is that there are expectations. And, and again, I, I like the turnover aspect. Now, th- think about, for example, a guy like, uh, what is it, Oliva Dotti, our inside linebacker coach. Is he going to get fired? He might still get fired, but there's a little bit of a contrast there. If he doesn't get fired, see, and that's the other thing. We, we forget that these guys spend every single day, for the most part, with these coaches. There's so much information you acquire. Think about how well you know people that you work with. Let's say you and five other people are responsible for different departments. Like your, your job is to keep this department up and running. Just because a department is up and running doesn't necessarily mean that this person's doing a good job. Maybe it's just kind of self-sufficient and stuff doesn't go wrong there. On the other hand, let's say we're looking at it and we see one department that's constantly down and constantly messed up and it's got terrible, you know, I, I'm trying to keep this general so we don't have to get too specific, but things are just never working there. And you look at it and say, well, the people there are terrible. And the equipment that's never running is garbage. It's from like the 80s. And then the person responsible for that department gets fired and you say, oh, well, that's not fair. It's not his fault. Well, how do you know? Maybe while everything was burning and on fire, he was kicking his feet up and just wasn't doing anything about it. Maybe both things are true. The point is, these coaches and Petten and and everybody else that are in, in, or not Petten, he's defense. I'm thinking Olivadotti, but Hackett and all these guys that are involved in this, If they saw a coach that was doing a very good job of getting people prepared, getting people coached up, doing the right things the right way, on time, every time, and he saw progress, he saw guys that understand what they were doing, I don't think he gets fired. I I trust them enough to at least understand the difference and say, look, this is a good coach who had a bad situation. I'm not going to follow the logic that they're so dumb that they don't even understand that. Well, we didn't get the production we wanted, so they're fired. And the fact that everyone jumps to that and wants to crucify people and assume that they're just they're just throwing a guy under the bus for no reason, the, the ascribing intent nonsense that is so prevalent is obnoxious. Maybe they made a big mistake, or maybe this is a guy who coached in college. This is his first time as a wide receiver coach in the NFL. By the way, LaFleur hired the guy, so he's probably going to be a little less inclined to say I want him out of here. However, he has a high standard. He has high expectations. Witte didn't meet those expectations. And I'm going to give LaFleur the benefit of the doubt that if he's not going to fire a really good coach because they were bad wide receivers. If you want to do that, you can do that. I think that's silly. Maybe it happened. I just see no reason to say Matt LaFleur is, a, is dumb and kind of a jerk. That's what you're doing, by the way. Matt LaFleur is too dumb to figure this out and know how this works. And he's a horrible person because he fired somebody that didn't do anything wrong. And you don't have to believe that. You're choosing to believe that. And not only believe it, but to just say it so. To not even say maybe this is what happened, and if so, that would be terrible. That's a fair assessment, and I would agree with that. But saying this is what happened, this is why. And you don't know that. Stop doing that. You don't know that. It's insane to me that people do that. Again, maybe, but also probably not. So anyways, I, I was asked about this, and, and my comment is essentially that I'm, I'm more or less indifferent. I like the fact that they maintain this high standard, right? The, the problem with the old regime was that people stuck around. They were loyal, and that is a problem. What you need are people that are very, very, very good at their job, and if they're not, I'm sorry to say they need to go. That's the nature of the industry. Not every job is that way. Not every job needs to be that cutthroat. But we're talking about the, the elite of the elite. And, 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 and beyond that, speaking to the ethics of it, I don't know that it's good to keep somebody on board that's less good while denying somebody else the opportunity that's more good. So let's, let's not forget that end of the equation. You're denying somebody else opportunities to get in because this guy's your buddy and you don't want to have to say, I'm sorry, you got to go find employment elsewhere. This does not seem to be the tone for Murphy and for Gutekunst, and for Lafleur, The idea is you will come here, you will execute, you will meet my standard, or you are out. And it doesn't, and, and, and again, first year guy. So it's not a matter of, okay, that didn't work, but you know, maybe this year we're going to try this, this, and this. Look, nope, sorry, you, you just, you're, you're not ready for this. 
This isn't working. So we're going to go out and find somebody else. I'm guessing it's going to be somebody that's got a little bit more experience. Maybe not. Maybe it'll be another college guy. I don't know. But for whatever reason, it didn't work. And we're not going to sit here and dance around this. We're not going to play with this. Plus, probably going to be a massive infusion of new wide receiver talent. And I say massive to mean basically I would, I would assume at least two new wide receivers. And so this would be a good time to kind of start from scratch. So I got a question from Jared on Twitter. So I want to kind of clarify a little bit of what I was saying a couple days ago. His question or, or hypothesis, I guess, is that maybe, for example, when I go on PFF or whatever and I see somebody only tends to have a good passing uh, or cover grade, talking about linebackers, coverage grade or run grade, it has more to do with the scheme and the situation that these guys are put in than the fact that guys can't really do it. couple things. First of all, it would kind of be a moot point because at the end of the day, they're still going to end being really good at one thing and really bad at, w- at another thing. It's just a question of why. And the why doesn't super matter in this regard. It's just a matter of it's just not working. Um, but I would say that it, it depends on the situation. For example, let's look at Blake Martinez in particular. I think that this is true for him because, again, if, if you look at what he did under Dom Capers, he actually was a really good linebacker and he was very good against the run, but he struggled against the pass. Mike Pettin came over, and it was like a 180 with this defense. Suddenly, they were really bad against the run, but they were better in coverage, including Blake Martinez. He was actually graded as one of the better linebackers, but inexplicably terrible against the run, but actually really good in coverage. This past year, though, that whole thing fell apart, and he stayed not good against the run because, again, the scheme change, as Jared pointed to, affected his ability to play the run. However, the issue is... He now has no ability to really be a cover guy. And so it's not as though the change in scheme switched him from good against the, or bad against the run, whatever. You know what I'm saying. It's that he does one thing really well, and he needs to find a scheme that suits that. So in that situation, you've got a guy that's good against the run, not super great in coverage, and needs to be in a particular scheme that suits him, and Blake Martinez isn't that guy. So in that case, it's not true that he can do both. It's just a matter of what scheme he's in is going to dictate whether he's good at one or the other or both. Now, is it true that there are guys that maybe can do both, but depending on the scheme, um, it might highlight one or, or low light the other? It's possible, but I, I think, for example, you look at guys like Luke Keekley that can do it. I think they can just do it. There are certain guys that can do it. There's just not many, and, and, and as I mentioned to him, it's not actually that surprising if you think about it. What is a linebacker? A linebacker is sort of like a defensive tackle corner hybrid. The, the the things that you're asked to do are so polar opposite. The the idea of somebody being really good at both is really, really, really unlikely. On one hand, you have to be able to be smaller, right? Ideally, you're smaller, you're faster, you're fluid, you're you're agile, right? Flipping your hips and 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 stop and go and all this stuff. And on the other hand, we want you to be bigger, we want you to be stronger, we want you to be able to hold your ground. We want you to be able to shed blocks. We want you to be able to wrap up and tackle. These are the the idea that somebody is going to be able to embody all of these things in one human being is so unbelievably rare. How can you do both? Like a, a you know a Ray Lewis, he's built like a, a monster, but he's super fast and quick and fluid. Plus he you know well whatever. And so I I tend to think that is, for example, when I mentioned that first round isn't great for linebackers, that's why we're going to continue to see guys go in the first round. Because the ideal linebacker is so rare, and people want to find that guy, and you're probably only going to find him in the first round. The problem is, at the end of the day, most of these guys, they still can't end up doing it. And so you see a lot of the high upside guys that are big and strong, but also move really fast. They're just these athletic freaks. They're going to go in the first round, in hopes that they can be the next Luke Keekley. Because again, super rare to find a guy like that. But at the end of the day, it usually ends up being the second round linebackers that are just quality guys. And again, there's still guys that are good at one and not so much the other. And it's really just up to the defensive coordinators to figure that out, how to make that work. You know, do we want to find these tweener guys that can do both, but maybe not quite as well either way? Or should we just go back to more old school, you know, bigger, stronger guy and a smaller, leaner guy? The problem with that is they get exploited. And so you're kind of stuck. On one hand, you try to find the needle in the haystack. On the other hand, it's, it's probably a lot easier to find the quick, fluid guys whose job is primarily to be, you know, the weak side. You're going to run and cover, and you're going to be sideline to sideline to make tackles and whatever. And you're going to have sort of the quote-unquote Mike linebacker that's going to, or the strong side, I guess. You know, the bigger, stronger, blocking stuff up kind of guy. It's probably a lot easier to find those guys individually, and you can find them later. 
but then you're probably just going to get exploited all the time because offensive coordinators are going to find ways to force your your non-agile linebacker to have to cover, and we're going to run at your weak guy who can't tackle or shed blocks. So I, I think it's a tough tough position, and maybe that's why a lot of teams resign themselves to just getting those mid-round guys and then bulking up the defensive line. You get a dominant defensive line that's going to do 90% of the work against the run, and the linebacker is there to more or less play clean up, and you try to, you know, the defensive line's job is to keep him clean, and, and probably why a lot of teams are also leaning toward the more faster, agile guys, right? Bulk up that defensive line, take the stress off the run game, off of the linebacker, and so if he's got to run and cover, he can do it. If he's got to flow sideline to sideline to make a tackle, he can do it. The bottom line, though, is he's not. his job isn't primarily to shed block. His job is to flow wherever the ball carrier is and make a tackle. And again, I think that's why you see the Pettons and a lot of the other dominant um, teams are investing so little in linebacker while they're getting their fourth and fifth dominant defensive tackle. Like, dude, you've already got, you've got a foot. Like, the, I remember when the Eagles did that. They went and got Michael Bennett, and they already had four high-priced dominant defensive tackles, and then they paid Michael Bennett a bunch of money. It's like, dude, you're, you're a 4-3 team. You've already got four guys. This is a number five, but that's just the way it goes, right? Jacksonville's done it. Packers do it, right? The, the first year Petten came in. We've got a defensive line. We've got um, Kenny Clark and Mike Daniels. And then the first thing we do, the first free agent we go pick up is a defensive tackle, the one thing we think we don't need on this team because of how important it is, getting a third you know, when we already have two. So I, in general, no, I don't think it's just scheme, although scheme plays a, a role in it. And for a lot of these guys, you do have to find a scheme that suits them. But no, in general, I don't. Th- I think for the most part, linebackers just do one or the other very well. If they do anything well at all, it's it's either they're really good against the run or they're really good in coverage. There are a handful that can do both. Sometimes it's a flukish thing where you know one year they kind of hold it down. I think it's extremely rare to find linebackers that can consistently play the run and cover very well. Again, I think it was about seven just this year, and, and a lot of those guys are flukish guys. One of them is Luke Keekley who retired. So going into next year, who can we confidently say is going to be a good run and cover guy? I, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I could look, but I I don't want to. I kind of do now. I don't have time for this, but I'm, I'm going to because I'm very interested. Let's see. So minus Luke Keekley, we have six linebackers that did both at least at a 70 grade or above in each category. Alexander Johnson played for the first time this year, so we'll have to see. He did have a pretty high coverage grade, but it was one of those things where he had two elite grades and mostly, especially the second half of the year, he barely had any 60s. So I'm guessing he's going to be, he, he could be a very good linebacker going forward. Vic Fangio, I'm sure, coached this guy up. He's great with linebackers, but um, very, very good against the run. I don't think he's going to consistently be a cover guy. I think there were two flukish games that propped up this grade. So I'm going to say that's enough. Eric Hendricks, dominant, dominant, dominant performance. Here's the thing, though. The last, <laughs> and this is why I've been saying Eric Hendricks is overrated. And everybody says I'm wrong, and this is the one time i got to eat my words, whatever. Eric Hendricks, over the last four years, not including this year, in run defense and coverage, one one time in one category had a grade over 70. In 2018, he didn't have a grade over 70 in either category. In 2017, not in either category. In 2016, not in either category. It was his rookie year. He had a 77.5 against the run. His coverage grade was a 42. This is the biggest fluke of a year I've ever seen in my entire life. And the fact of the matter is, if you look at it, almost all of his run defense grade just came to a dead screeching halt after week 8. The guy had one game where he had a grade in the 70s against the run. It was week 14 against the Lions, and it was exactly 70.6. Prior to that, he had a bunch of 80s and a 90s. I don't know what happened between week 2 and week 8. The guy played out of his absolute mind, but I, I, whatever it was, hopefully that dies out because he, he literally was probably the best linebacker in all of football. This guy has been a mediocre line. His, his grades for four years, 58, 68, 66, 64. This year, 90.4. This is, this is a fluke. So no, I don't expect this to be a consistent thing where he's good at both. Demario Davis, another relative fluke. Now, he, he was garbage for five years. He was good for two years. And again, this year, 90.4. He has never had a good coverage grade ever until this year. He had an 88.3. Again, no idea what happened to him. He's 31 years old, by the way, so the odds of this keeping up are are basically zero. But he's had three years in a row being solid against the run, so that may continue. The odds of this guy, whose highest coverage grade prior to this was a 66, repeating at 88, pretty close to zero. 
So, so far, we got nothing. Here's a guy, though, Darius Leonard. Kind of was a real big name last year in Indy. One of the better linebackers. Super exciting. Last year, he had a 70 run defense grade and an 84 coverage grade. This year, 78 run defense grade, 70 coverage grade. He almost didn't make the coverage thing, but he's done it two years in a row now. Darius Leonard is one so far. Josh Bynes, same thing. Good run defense guy. Never been good in coverage. This year he did. And again, it's just every one of these linebackers that's good in coverage is because of like four games. More games are, are average than than anything else. And that's the thing. Just be average most of the year and then have a couple good games. And you end up in the 70s. That's what Josh Bynes did. He had one year now. And, and you know, scheme probably does play a big part in this. To help him do the things that he needs to do, I don't think I'm going to see this consistent, consistently. I don't think most people will. Now, maybe, because he did go to Baltimore, even though he was there for two years before. But maybe they're just putting him in a situation to thrive. But again, this is a 30-year-old guy. He's going into year 31. I just, I have a hard time believing a th- you know, 31-year-old guy is going to be dominant in coverage for a very long time, or even as a linebacker for a very long time. Maybe, but probably not. Again, he's never done it before. And then lastly, Levante David. Levante David, there's some potential here. Some very good potential, actually. He's done this for three years in a row now. He's been a solid cover guy for almost every year, except to, it was 2012, his rookie year, he had a 65. 2015, it dipped down to 64. Every other year has been 70s, 80s, and then this year a 90. He's been good against the run except a three-year stretch between 2014 and 2016. This guy's legit. By the way, what round did I say was the money round? For linebackers, what round did I say was the money round? Second round, right? Darius Leonard and Levante David. You want to take a guess what round they were taken in? Both of them, second round. Levante David was taken in the second round of 2012. Darius Leonard, second round of 2018. By the way, if you're curious, Eric Hendricks, second round. Alexander Johnson, undrafted free agent. The other money round. So again, this this whole idea of, of you know, you got to take them early. And, and just think about over the years how many elite. And I want you to think about that going into this year because I'm, I'm doing the same thing. I'm looking at Patrick Queen. I'm looking at all these guys, and I'm licking my chops like, dude, I want them so bad. Listen to me. You, you know what I'm saying, so don't even go there. What I'm saying is they look like really good football players that would look good on the Packers. Don't mess with me. But how many, every single year there's linebackers we fall in love with. And what I'm saying to you is I want you, I want you to do your, for yourself a, a mental inventory. All the guys that you said are just freaks that you would love the Packers to get. Who are they and where are they now? Write them out. Go, go in the Packernet Podcast Facebook group. Tell me all the, the linebackers over the last 10 years that you can remember in the first round during the draft process saying, dude, if we could get him, it would change everything. And then tell me what they're doing. Not saying I know Patrick Queen isn't going to work out or any of that stuff. Eventually, there's going to be another Luke Keekley. There's going to be that first round guy that everybody identifies as a great linebacker. He's going to be a great linebacker, and everyone's going to say, See, I told you. Because a stop clock is right. Well, a stop clock is right more often than linebackers in the first round. I can tell you that. Anyways, why don't we take a break here? Because I got three more things to talk about. I'm rapidly running out of time. We'll take a break, and we'll be right back. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple, just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place 
and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. All right, so I want to address um, two things that were brought up, uh, two guys that are kind of circulating on Twitter in terms of should the Packers go out and get them. Number one is uh, tight end Greg Olson. He has just left the uh, Carolina Panthers. That's a very easy no. This is a situation, and I think most people understand, but a lot of people look at it and say Greg Olson. They understand he was one of the best linebackers, or <laughs> I'm stuck on it, one of the best tight ends for, for several years. I mean, he was he was a top tight end, and there's very few of them. So you go back to any time period, there's going to be maybe like three or four tight ends that are like, wow, these guys are good, right? You know, the the Gronks, Greg Olson, Travis Kelsey, whatever. There, there's like three in a given year. And Greg Olson was one of those three for several years. However, like a lot of tight ends, when it falls off, it just falls off. And for Greg Olson, it fell off several years ago. And so this is an even bigger no and a bigger fall off than uh, you saw from Jimmy Graham, because at least Jimmy Graham was getting a bunch of touchdowns with Seattle. Greg Olson is just, he's done nothing. And it's weird. I, I remember when, when everybody was dogging Olson like that first year when he w- just stopped producing. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Why why would you even, and maybe this was just last year, I don't know, or, or two years, whatever, 2018 season I'm talking about. But the bottom line is he fell off. Uh, Carolina understands he's fallen off. I don't think there's going to be a resurgence. I understand the whole, well, he didn't have a good situation and all that. But look, Cam Newton was around. Cam Newton was there. Cam Newton relied on this guy for a long time. They had a great relationship. Um, they, they dominated the NFL, those two, for a long time. That was a really tough matchup to account for. And it just died out. It's not like Cam was not there that whole time. He might have missed a lot this year, but this isn't the first year of his decline. He's, he's been off the radar for a long time. I mean, just, just think back to the last time you remember hearing Greg Olson being real good. So that's an easy no. The other one, and this one has come up several times now. This one came up last time when he got kicked around. Uh, Josh Rosen as a backup quarterback. I've always been on board with this. I had no problem with the prospect of drafting him if he fell. Josh Rosen was actually my, I don't know if I would say my QB one that year. My, my favorite quarterback was Baker Mayfield, but I felt like Josh Rosen was the safe pick. And I, I, I don't, it's one of those positions I fully admit I'm probably not super great at, at scouting. My, my favorite to do are linebackers and running back. All the other ones are really difficult. I don't, I don't know. I, I, mean, I just, I guess I don't get the nuance. I, I can watch it and say, these are my guys. And that's kind of what it was. Rosen and Baker were my guys. I didn't like Darnold. I thought he was goofy and I just, he didn't, he didn't impress me at all. Uh, Josh Allen, nah. I did like uh, Lamar, but again, my concern with Lamar was more to do with the idea that it's very hard to find somebody. It's similar to the linebacker thing. Somebody who's very good at uh, coverage and um, stopping the run. It's very hard to find someone that's good at both. And I, th- that was my concern with Lamar, is that when you get to the pros and you try to be both a very good passer and a very good runner, it just it's too hard. It's too hard of a job, and most people can't do both. But obviously, he's doing both right now. But either way, Rosen was my guy. And this whole thing has confused me for a long time. There, I, I feel like there's information that I don't have. Because the NFL has given up on him, and that makes no sense. This was an easy first-round guy. He went to the worst team in all of football with a terrible offensive line, no real wide receivers. I mean, he did have Christian Kirk and um, Larry Fitzgerald, but it, it just it was a bad situation. There was no run game. I mean, they had just hired new coaches. Those coaches got fired instantly. And then after that, he goes to Miami. And granted, he lost the job there. So there, there's obviously some struggles with Rose. But he's got talent. I don't know why it's not coming out on the field, but I don't see any super big downside, especially as cheap as he's going to be now to making the move to go get Rosen and just sit him behind Rodgers. We've all seen the clip of Aaron Rodgers and, and, and Rosen working together. Rosen seems to be a really sharp guy when he was explaining things to him, and you saw how Rosen kind of lit up and was like, oh, wow, like Rodgers is really teaching him some stuff. I don't think he'd be a threatening candidate to Rodgers. There's no way Rodgers would ever think he'd lose his job to Rosen. And because they do have very similar personality types, I think that they would get along really well. I think Rodgers would be a great tutor. And, and here's the other thing. I actually think Rosen might work out really well with LaFleur. If you think about the what Matt LaFleur, at its essence, that offense does, it's no different than the Shanahan offense or the McVay offense in which you don't have to have a great quarterback to run it. Rosen went to Arizona to basically be the savior. We have a terrible offensive line. We have no offense. We have no anything. You have to go there and pull us out and make this work. 
if if Matt LaFleur gets the team the way that he wants this team, the scheme is the main thing, and, and you get to be a Goff or a Garoppolo. And I, I listen, I know fans of those teams, especially 49ers fans, think Garoppolo is this great quarterback. He's not that great. He's good, not great. And I think Rosen can be good, not great. I think if you're a cerebral quarterback that can follow directions and, and make reads and understand the system, and if you allow him to sit behind Rodgers for literally a couple years, just sit there and just learn and understand and absorb the Matt LaFleur system and what you're supposed to do and what and when and where and why, I think he can become a very good quarterback. Here's the other thing. Josh Rosen is 22 years old. I don't know how that's possible. He's 22. He is turning 23 this year. There are guys that are getting drafted this year that are going to be older than Josh Rosen. Drafted this year. Not last year, which was also true. Dude, his name is Joshua Ballinger Lippincott Rosen. Wow. That's interesting. Hmm. I, I, I just feel like it could work. And I, I, I again, I feel like I'm missing some information because the NFL has given up. The fact that he went for, what did he get traded for? Like a third round pick or something? That blows my mind. I think I even said if he if, if he goes for a third or less, the Packers should trade for him. Now I'm guessing he's worth less than that. And so he is under contract with the Miami Dolphins, so there would need to be some kind of compensation. But I, I just feel like they wouldn't even be able to recoup their third. So we're talking about what? Especially if they're going to draft Tua or draft a quarterback. Josh Rowe, I mean, they're, they, they, they're to the point where you almost just want to cut the guy. I mean, maybe not because he's 22 and you want to develop him, but you've got a lot of quarterbacks on your roster. How much do you want to invest in Josh Rosen? I mean, I don't know, maybe, okay, you don't have a lot of quarterbacks, but bottom line is you're keeping Ryan Fitzpatrick, who's a clear number two. At least that's the assumption, that's what has been said, is that Ryan Fitzpatrick is staying in Miami. So if you draft a quarterback, you have, you're, are you going to pay to keep Josh Rosen as your number three? I just feel like if you can get like a fifth round pick for him, that would be more valuable. In fact, you could do that before the draft, get a fifth round pick and plug him in this year. And yes, my, my answer stays the same. I, I think it would be worth it. As, as useless as uh, sixth and seventh round picks are, We've got two sixths and two sevenths. Dude, just take all four. I don't care. <laughs> no, I mean, that's that's probably too much. But really, I mean, if if we if there's any way in the world they would take one of our sixth-round picks, maybe that's too little. I don't know. Remember, Brett Hundley went for a sixth-round pick. I, I, I'm just saying, if we have two sixth-round. If they're going to take a sixth, if they would take both sixths, I'd rather do that than a fifth, by the way, or a sixth and a seventh or whatever. we got two sixths and two sevenths. You can have a sixth and a seventh. I could not care any less. Again, they're basically useless pick. You're not getting any quality in round six or seven. Almost never, ever. I'm talking, you know, getting top 32 guys, it never happened. Almost zero times. So to, to be able to get Rosen and, and, and not say you're the starter, right? Just, be, just hit reset. Like, look, this was crazy. You've been on a whirlwind. whirlwind. Like, forget all that. You're going to come here. You're going to learn my system. You're going to become an expert in this system. You're going to learn from Rodgers. You're going to learn from our quarterback coach. You're going to learn from me, LaFleur. You're going to learn from Hackett. We're going to make you like a PhD in this system. And again, the goal is not for you to be Aaron Rodgers, not for you to put the team on your back and make crazy plays. Your job is to be a robot, to simply go out and and just make the simple, easy throw to the guy that is designated to get the ball. Understand the situation. Make the right read. As the play develops, you know, you know, go through your progress, and it's just, it's just there. You just understand the situation. And I, again, I think the Lafleur system, the Shanahan system, it's built for that kind of stuff. You got to be a little bit, you got to have it going on upstairs to be able to understand what to do. But it's not, you know, taking, you know, Russell Wilson running to the sideline, throwing sidearms, you know, Pat Mahomes, Aaron Rodgers, forty-yard pass off your back foot, throwing tight window throw. Like, forget that. Forget trying to get Rosen to do that stuff. I think he, he could potentially, if you give him time to learn and grow, could become a very good system quarterback, a, a Garoppolo, a, a golf. Why not? You, you're telling me he can't do what Brady's done all these years? I mean, that's a bit of a stretch. I, he can't do everything Brady does. But, in, I mean, we've seen the, the highlights, like the jokeable highlights about Tom Brady just throwing to the open guy all the time. Of course Rosen could do that because every quarterback in history could do that. So, again, my answer is yes. It's always been yes. Is it a massive priority? Of course not, but depending on compensation. So last time I said if he's worth a third or less, you got to do it. This time, the no-brainer for me is a sixth. If they want a fifth, it's kind of iffy because, I mean, fifth-round picks you could do some stuff with, and I don't want to be flippant with that. I'd, again, I'd, I literally would rather give up two sixths for a f- than a fifth. Arguably two sixths and two sevenths. <laughs> I'd rather give up than a fifth. I don't think most people would agree with that, but I don't care. I just I hate the sixth and seventh round. We should just get rid of it. There's nobody of value there ever. 
You just do five rounds and then free agency. Just go nuts. But anyways, I did have one big project I was going to get to. We're going to have to save it for tomorrow. But essentially, somebody had asked me the question or had said that I should look into these contracts and say, how exactly are we going to sign these guys? So I went through and I, I did contracts for Kenny Clark and uh, a bunch of other guys. So it's kind of a two-parter. So technically, I didn't finish. So this is good. It'll give me another day to finish. But the, the, the first part is who outside of Kenny Clark could possibly get extended because he's not the only one. And then beyond that, how could we actually resign all these guys and still have money? And so I started looking at, I tried to, part of the reason it took so long, number one, is because I kept getting the math wrong. And so I redid it about seven times. And then the other issue was finding comps. And I always wanted to use Green Bay Packers as comps, but sometimes there just isn't any, especially if we're talking about second contracts, because the Packers just don't give them, which is another thing that kind of gives me pause. I went, you go through this whole roster, especially guys that make it to free agency, because usually if you're worth keeping, they're going to just extend you. Guys that made it all the way to free agency. In other words, they're free agents. They're available to go somewhere else this year. And then you offer them a contract, especially if that's the second time or what, you know, so I started saying, forget it, I'm just going to go out into other teams. Even though you can clearly see just by the structure of this, this is not a structure the Packers would use. Let's just use it anyways as as sort of an explainer of what it could look like. And so I've got four contracts done for guys that could get extensions. Today I'll work on some of our free agents. And then by tomorrow we'll be able to look at what these contracts look like. And especially because the thing everybody wants to know is how can you possibly pay all these guys in the first year that's what we'll look. How much is it going to cost us this year? And it, and it's not definitive. It's just here's an option and a way that it could look. But anyways, that's going to be it for today. Make sure you check out tomorrow. By the way, I haven't been doing On This Day in History because some of the On This Day in History episodes are just are not pertinent. You know, like a look at uh, the, the Carolina Panthers who we're going to be playing this year, right? Like, eh, that's, a, that's too much of a stretch, and I'm not going to republish that one. But uh, that is still going to be going on once I can find relevant things or interesting things. Um but previewing teams that are going to be playing in 2018, I just feel like that's super not interesting. Anyways, you folks have yourselves a fantastic day. I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.